This is my favorite picture of my mom, Miralda Mimi Kasargian. Those of you that know my daughter Satine can see a striking resemblance between granddaughter and grandmother. Mom was one of the most gentle, kindest, and uh, most compassionate mothers, wives, professionals, and friends that I ever knew. She raised two boys through a civil war, a revolution, and also being teenagers in 1980s America, and I think the last part was probably the hardest. Nineteen years ago, uh, just after her 53rd birthday, mom was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of uh, brain cancer. And even the best doctors said that the prognosis was not good. And their recommendation was the standard arsenal of technologies at the time. Radiation, surgery, chemotherapy. And we couldn't believe this. As a family, we said, how could this happen to mom? She's too young. How could we do without her, as was said earlier? And as we discussed the choices that we had, um, we were weighing the uncertain benefits of these treatments, these technological approach, along with the near certain risks. Loss of basic functions as a result of invasive surgery, the terrible side effects of chemotherapy, and probably the worst thing, the cycle of procedure after procedure, not knowing what the end was going to be. In the end, mom made the decision for us. She said, you know, I want to enjoy every day that I have left at home with my family. She said, no chemotherapy, no surgery, no technology, other than some localized radiation, some steroids to reduce the swelling of the tumor. And over the nine months that mom lived, uh, between, over the nine months between the first diagnosis and her passing away, she lived at home comfortably, received countless visitors, and was even able to go to Spain to my brother Ara's wedding. In the end, she passed away in her own bed with her loved ones around her. Um, we as humans are an incredibly inventive species. We have gone from being hunter-gatherers over the course of several thousand years, from being hunter-gatherers to building mega-cities while at the same time being able to compress the entire knowledge, or almost the entire knowledge of humankind, into a small device like a smartphone. And we're so convinced that we can continue to make things better and better by just having enough thought and effort that we now have scientists that are working on regenerative tissues that will slow down aging and lengthen life. We have um, uh, Elon Musk, who is the founder of uh, Tesla Motors, wanting to take tourists into space. This is what we can do with technology, and we should be proud of ourselves, right? After all, we've been able to significantly reduce infant mortality through modern medicine, and industrial farming and modern farming techniques have allowed us to reduce famine and enable this little planet of ours to hold many more of us than in the past. And uh, we have a printing press, that, and then the internet have brought democracy and literacy to the masses. So that today, a little child in southern Asia has access to Harvard's curriculum for free. Pretty amazing. This is a picture of the Gatling gun. It was invented in 1862 and was used for the first time in the American Civil War. Before uh, the Gatling gun was invented, for thousands of years, warfare was basically man versus man, or one thrust or one shot at a time. The Gatling gun and the machine gun that came after it fundamentally changed the nature of warfare, because all of a sudden, one soldier could kill or injure tens or even hundreds of others in a very short amount of time. Ironically, its inventor, Dr. Richard Gatling, said he invented it because he wanted to reduce the number of people that would fight, so that therefore, and therefore reducing the number of people that would die in combat or disease. He wanted to show how futile war was. But what happened? The exact opposite. Because we couldn't comprehend what we had built, the Gatling gun and the machine gun led to the horrors of the two world wars, and then in rapid succession to Vietnam, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and now Artsakh. This is a picture of a Russian-made TOS-1 multi-rocket launcher, which launches uh, incendiary missiles and was used to such devastating effect just two weeks ago against our boys 
on the front line. Why is it that as humans, we, are better, we find better and better ways of killing each other, but can't seem to suppress the urge to kill? Said differently, why is it that our appetite to want to advance technology far outpaces our ability to understand the impacts of that technology on our society, on our culture, on ourselves? This is actually the theme in a uh, class that I took in college called Sociocultural Implications of High Technology. And even 30 years later, I think of Professor Texter's class when I look at the following. You know, a picture of a family enjoying themselves over dinner, talking about what happened during the day, having turned into a family each drawn into their own, own online world through a various smart device. Right? Or if I think that I can, I can now watch any movie I want or listen to any music that I, that I want to, wherever and wherever I am on this device, only to realize that there are fewer and fewer new good movies worth watching or new music worth listening to. It's, are we at a point where Facebook GIFs and three-minute YouTube videos have actually replaced the classics we used to watch together in a movie theater? How many have heard of the application called Tinder? Tinder is a social application that has a very basic premise. You upload your profile, which is essentially your picture, and Tinder makes that profile available to other Tinder users within a geographic radius that you define. And similarly, you have, uh, it feeds you the profiles of other people. And what you do is, if you like somebody, you swipe to the right, and if you don't like somebody, you swipe to the left. And if two people both swipe to the right, Tinder enables them to connect, text each other, and therefore meet. Sounds great, right? What a better way to meet people than hanging out in a bar waiting to see somebody. Well, I'll let you be the judge of that. Here's some quotes from some Tinder users. You're always sort of prowling. You could talk to two or three girls at a bar and pick the best one, or you can swipe a couple of hundred people a day. The sample size is so much larger. It's setting up two or three Tinder dates a week, and chances are sleeping with all of them so you could rack up 100 girls you've slept with with a year, within a year. Or, it's like ordering seamless, says Dan, the investment banker, referring to the online food delivery service. This is the menu AM of New York. But you're ordering a person. Is this what we've progressed to as humans? When feeding our, uh, feeding our vices is more important than replenishing our souls? The subject of man versus machine has taken on a new twist over the last few weeks. Technology visionaries such as Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and even Elon Musk, the guy who wants to take us into space, have been warning about the dangers of taking technological advancement too far. And 20 years ago, an uh, IBM program called Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov for the first time in chess, something that hadn't been done. And just last week, a Google prog program called DeepMind beat Lee Sedol, who is the world champion in Go, which is an ancient form of Asian strategy game. And just to put this in perspective, in a game of Go has more possible move combinations than the entire number of particles in the known universe. So think about the amount of technology, the amount of processing power that we've been able to create. Now, Let's bring this home a little bit, and let's talk about driverless cars, right? What a great concept. You no longer have to focus on the road or put your hand on the wheels. You can just sit and do Facebook while you're being driven to wherever you want. Well, what happens if the software that's running that car runs into a pug, bug as you're going 100 kilometers down an, uh, an hour down the freeway? Or worse yet, what happens if the software or somebody controlling the software decides where to take you? instead of you deciding where you want to go? Are we at the edge of a technological disaster? Is there a way where we can get technology to do what we want instead of technology telling us what we should do or where we should go? I think so, and I'll come back to my mom. Because ultimately, she chose humanity over technology she chose the certainty of a few days and weeks with her family over the uncertainty of a struggle using medical weapons of mass destruction. Ultimately, compassion and love prevailed over 
protocols, and technology. Three floors above, we're working on a project to bring uh, robotics and programming classes to children in villages throughout Armenia. Now, will this replace the loss of dignity that these communities are facing as people leave because of emigration? I'm not sure. But one of the projects we're working on, or that the kids will work on, is to create automatic mind detection robots that will help to clear the mines around the villages in, uh, on the borders. A couple of years ago, another TEDx speaker spoke about bringing an expert in sensors and electronics to Armenia and taking them again to villages around Armenia. And in one village, when he talked about how heat and light and sound sensors work, the young people in the village developed an automatic warning system that would turn on super bright lights at night when wolves would come into the village, and therefore saving the chicken and livestock in those villages from being eaten by the same wolves. We have NGOs today that are using social technologies to uh, highlight the injustice and actually mobilize community action against domestic violence. We have other programs that are using these same technologies to, for example, create a living memory of the genocide by planting new forests throughout Armenia. Or these same technologies are allowing unemployed physicists in Armenia to teach chess to students around the world and therefore earn an income. There are fab labs now being brought from MIT to Armenia to help the next generation of future scientists develop new things that are going, hopefully, make this a better world. So as I come back to the statement I made earlier, is our appetite to develop technology going faster than our ability to deal with what that technology means? I think the answer is yes, especially if we think about things, not just the examples that I just brought, but all of the examples that you're using in your daily lives to try to make our society, our country, our, our planet a better place. I fundamentally believe that if humanity drives technology, it can and will lead to good. Now, just to sort of bring this again back to you, the next time you go to a cafe and, and with a friend and you're about to pick up your smartphone to check Facebook, I would urge you to remember this. Thank you very much.